now we're glad to welcome uh, Dr. Albertini, Tamara Albertini from the University of uh, Hawaii today at the center. Um, she um, is an expert on uh, Renaissance and Islamic philosophy. So I'd like to ask her some questions on uh, Islamic philosophy as uh, this is one um, topic here at the University of Paderborn, particularly within the Diversity Project in the Philosophy zu Hause. Um, maybe I would like first to ask you uh, a very fundamental que question about um, uh, what led you to work on Islamic philosophy. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Let me start with that. Yeah, this is uh, really a pleasure and a privilege. I haven't been in Germany in uh, years, so this is great, thank you. But we will speak English because we want to have a wider audience. What, um, what took me to Islamic philosophy? You know, frankly spoken, uh, none of it was planned. So um, I started studying philosophy uh, in Basel in Switzerland, then I went to Munich for my PhD, and I discovered the Renaissance, and that was a great excitement. And I was still not thinking of doing anything with, Islam with Islamic philosophy until one day I was looking at a page of Giordano Bruno, And uh, I saw the names of Muslim philosophers. And I don't know, something dawned on me and I thought, hmm, you know, I could read those texts in the original. Now that was a little bit presumptuous. It is true that I had learned classical Arabic, but just going straight to reading a philosophical text that has been, you know, put together centuries earlier, that's, that's another step, but I, I got there. Um, why did I think I could read those texts? Well, I was lucky enough to grow up in Tunisia. I was um, there from the age of four to 14. Nowadays, I like to say my parents were visionaries. I didn't think like that as a child, but you know, as an adult, you give them more credit. And um, uh, I think they were visionaries because they put me in the public school. You see, all the other foreigners we knew, mostly French, were um, you know, safely tugging away their children in the French school, a Mission Francaise. Uh, but my parents didn't think so, and so there I had a wonderful upbringing, you know, surrounded by Tunisian children, um, learning the Tunisian dialect, the beloved Tunsi, learning classical Arabic in school, and even going to the Qurani classes. I remember one day uh, my father speaking to my Quranic teacher, and the um, person said to my father, Monsieur Albertini, you know, of course we understand uh, you are Christian, Uh, you can take your, your daughter out of the Qurani class anytime. Mm. And uh, I was so happy to hear it because, uh, you know, being in a Qurani class means you have to memorize, right? And every test is about reciting from memory. So I thought, yes, this is great. You know, I don't have to do that anymore. And to my shock, my father said, oh, no, no, we'll keep her there. It's good for her. And I thought, gee, you know. <laughs> But years later, more like decades later, That's really the knowledge I was able to tap into to um, study uh, actively Islamic philosophy and then to respond in more creative ways, um, to put it that way, after the September 11 attacks. So that changed pretty much also the direction of my research. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, noticed that you use the term Islamic philosophy, Islamic. Right. This is a bit disputed. Uh, do you think that the, the term Islamic philosophy is um, is adequate? Is adequate? Sorry, is adequate to to designate this particular or this philosophical tradition? Uh, and what is actually meant with this term Islamic philosophy? It is a big debate, and um, so everybody in the field has to basically constantly point out what they mean by it. Um, Even in the Arab world, in the Arab Islamic world, it's a big debate. Um, I'm right now on a lecturing tour. So I was, um, I was in Tunisia, I was in Egypt. I'm going to go to Lebanon later this year. And um, what I'm actually interested right now in my own research is Arab philosophy. And I, here it gets complicated because in the older orientalistic school, um, Arabic philosophy and Islamic philosophy were used interchangeably. And I understand why. Most of the texts of Islamic philosophy were written in Arabic language. And so people felt like, hey, you know, Arab philosophy, Arab uh, Islamic philosophy, it's the same thing. It's highly problematic. I have a problem with Islamic philosophy being called 
Arab philosophy, because you can't take the language as the label. To my students in Hawaii, I say, well, since I moved to the United States, I write in English, but that doesn't make me a contributor to English philosophy, does it? Right? So if you look at the ethnicity of the major figures, I mean, really towering figures of Islamic philosophy, yes, some were Arabs, others were Persians, again, others were um, Africans, uh, some of them were, um, you know, Kabyles or uh, Amazigh from the original population of North Africa. And as you look at Islamic philosophy down the centuries, I mean, you have Islamic philosophy also in China. You see, what happened is there that you, the, the descendants of the Persian merchants who used to do business in China at some point settled, 17th century more or less, they're called the Hui. And they brought Islamic philosophy and Islamic mysticism with them on the Silk Road and up to, you know, up to China. So you call that Arab philosophy and everybody who is not an ethnic Arab is excluded. Not to mention that in time, Islamic philosophy was written in many languages. Um, you know, we do have texts even by Ibn Sina. Europeans continue to call him Avicenna with a Latinized name, but Ibn Sina has a text that he has written in, 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 in Farsi, in Persian. Al-Ghazali has a wonderful little text that he wrote in, in Persian. Um, there is much in the Turkish tradition that we are not able to access because it was written in Turkish. It was written in Ottoman Turkish, which is some, something no one knows how to read nowadays. It's really a handful of specialists. So I call the classical um, period um, Islamic philosophy. But there is right now Arab philosophy and it's contemporary Arab philosophy. Now see, because I work at the University of Hawaii in a department that specializes in comparative philosophy, so I learn from my colleagues who do Chinese, Japanese, Buddhist, Indian philosophy, and I realize, well, you know, so what makes something a text of Chinese philosophy, right? What makes it Japanese? What makes it Indian, right? And so that, that becomes then my question to, why do I say that there is right now Arab philosophy? Okay, it has to be written by Arabs, it has to be written in Arabic language. It has to address the Arab world. It has to reflect on Arab values, Arab future, Arab reforms, Arabic language, which is a wonderful philosophical language to work with. So you see, it's, a, it's all about an Arab world. And that has never happened in the past. You look at um, Al-Ghazali, you look at Al-Farabi, you look at Al-Kindi. I mean, yes, they wrote in Arabic, you know, they hardly ever spend any time thinking about Arab values, <laughs> right? They, de they never explored it in a philosophical way. Now, let's look at the other side. Why is it then problematic, or why should it be problematic to call the tradition that I work in Islamic philosophy? Well, because there is also Islam, the religion, right? Uh, there is Christian philosophy, but um, you know, usually we single out a, a, a number of authors and we say, oh, they're fine representatives of that tradition, but not every Western philosopher is a Christian philosopher. Leibniz was privately a Christian, Kant was privately a Christian, but you know, they didn't write Christian philosophy, you see? Well, we don't have any other term, so we'll call it Islamic philosophy, and uh, understanding that religion is somehow part of the worldview, mm -hmm. but it's going to be Islamic as a culture, not as a religion. And yes, so yeah. there is Islamic philosophy and there is Arab philosophy right now. Yeah, um, this is a very um, uh, clarifying answer, which reveals many problems of the intercultural philosophy when you say, okay, um, the um, Islamic philosophy, the philosophical tradition is Islamic. Can we say that about the European tradition? Is, is the European tradition a Christian tradition? You say, no, it isn't. I think this is also a standpoint which is debated. But um, we won't um, stay at this point. I, I, I have a, a more general quest question concerning this. If we, if we would like to, to oppose 
this two different traditions, the philosophical tradition in the Islamic world and our so-called Western philosophical tradition. What do you say? How do these philosophical traditions relate to oh. one another? Well, they, they, they once did relate. They don't seem to relate much nowadays. You see, um, and here is the thing I need to mention before I talk about the Greeks and their impact on uh, Islamic philosophy. Before Greek philosophical texts were translated into Arabic, there already was a rationalist school of thought, and that's the Mu'tazila. If you're a follower of that tr tradition, you are a Mu'tazilite. Um, it's not a school of thought in the sense that, um, you know, Mu'tazilites ever agreed on, anyth on anything. The impression is rather that they never agreed on anything. And yet what united them was an endeavor to always start with rational principles first. So, um, no, there they were also Muslim philosophers and theologians, but they were mostly philosophers because when it came to principles, their position was very clear. You have to place yourself outside the text. And that's something that would be wonderful if it could be discussed among Muslim theologians today, today because you know, everybody does the quoting game. I know this passage, another person knows another passage, and everybody seems to be contradicting um, you know, each other because they're always good at finding a passage to support their views. But the Matazila assumes there are rational principles, and it's in the light of those rational principles that you go to the scriptural text. Their assumption, and this is not um, often seen, their assumption, and that assumption is went like a red thread through the entire tradition of Islamic philosophy. Their assumption is that um, scripture is a rational document. So if you reason well outside the text, you will never find yourself contradicting the text. Right? It's wonderful. And, you know, and they, they were very sure about it. I mean, like, would anyone say God is not rational? God is, of course, rational. Would, would God as a rational being reveal things that are not rational? Of course not, and so forth, right? So there was that very powerful uh, movement. They were frankly, you know, um, dictatorial. Everybody in the West knows something or thinks they know something about the Inquisition. There was also an Inquisition in the Islamic world. However, for a very long time, the Inquisition was controlled by the Mu'tazilites. So their thing was, if you are not rational, <laughs> well, then you'll get in trouble with us. It all changed in the course of the ninth century. They lost their dominant position, and then more conservative theologians started to dominate the scene. But now let's go back to, you know, what is, you know, Islamic philosophy and how does it relate to Western philosophy? Um, it is, you know, in the ninth century, that major endeavors started where Greek texts were translated into Arabic. Before that, some texts were translated, but they were typically going through the Syrians. Syriac is, is also a Semitic language. So before the Arabs entered um, Syria in the seventh century, there already was a very, very um, lively and complex uh, philosophical um, area. So, the Syrians had already translated texts from Greek into Syriac, and then they translated from Syriac into Arabic for their Arab patrons. But at some point, the Arabs felt like, I know, why do we have to go through Syriac? Let's go straight from Greek to, to Arabic. And so you have uh, all the major names of you know, ancient Greece. I mean, the philosophers, of course, Plato and, and Aristotle, but then also the school of Alexandria. You have the whole medical tradition. You have the whole mathematical tradition. And so step by step, all of that got transferred right, into the Islamic world. And Muslims did a phenomenal job with all these sources. It's not like they just, you know, like to have copies of these texts in their libraries. No, they developed further the ideas of the Greeks, both scientifically and philosophically. Philosophically speaking, they were, of course, looking at what they could use for their own worldview. And so you find, in time, Islamic philosophy becoming one of those lively hybrids Right? I mean, all great civilizations were hybrids. You know, purism is the pest of this world. In the moment you have a culture 
a country uh, that says, oh, we want to have our sources only, right? We want to read texts only in pure French, you know, French purged everything that was not French sometime in the 17th century. All the words that came from Provençal, that came from Italian, kicked out, right? Pure French. It, be, it was an impoverishment of French language. So um, it didn't happen in the first centuries of Islam, quite the opposite. They embraced all sorts of texts, um, not just Greek ones, Indian ones, Persian ones. It was wonderful, right? Of course, like every civilization, Islam too went through uh, various phases. At some point, the purists said, what's wrong with Arabic? What's wrong with, um, you know, Arabic poetry, Arabic language, and so forth. And Debates then, uh, you know, took place that lasted centuries. Not, not, no, no dramatic changes happened. The Mu'tazilite ideas survived. The Mu'tazila was gone, but their ideas did survive. All the, this heritage that came from the Greeks survived, but then it went further transformations uh, down the line. Now, um, what makes Islamic philosophy a tradition in its own right is that Muslim philosophers never just wanted to do what the Greeks did. They were choosy. They were looking at what was in those texts that they could use. You see, for many years, um, already as a graduate student, I was wondering how many more treatises on the intellect, you know, do I have to read in the tradition of Islamic uh, philosophy? You know, okay, they love the Greeks. All of them say, oh, we love the Greeks. Okay, they love the Greeks. They love Plato, they love Aristotle. But then you spend your entire life thinking about the theory of the intellect, which is highly complicated. Everyone who's ever studied Aristotle knows it's the kind of subject that you should never write a dissertation on. So if anyone is listening, don't, don't touch it. Or maybe do. But if you do, take a look at uh, Islamic philosophy. It took me years to understand what's in it. I mean, seriously, you dedicate your entire life to Aristotle's theory of the intellect. And then one day it dawned on me, they thought, that the theory of in the intellect was something like the rational blueprint of revelation. They thought that the theory of the intellect was really explaining what happened to the Prophet Muhammad when he received his revelations. Now, you know, you read the Quran, you read the Islamic tradition, and the story goes, the angel Gabriel, Jibreel appeared, right? And everybody thinks of wings or whatever, right? Muslim philosophers, maintained for a long time, if you're not an educated person, for whatever reasons, if you did not have a chance to, you know, refine your mind and such, well, the story of the angel of Gabriel is just the right thing. Just, you know, keep the story, it's lovely, it will maintain your faith. However, philosophers have a different way of approaching this. And you can tell between the lines, you know, how philosophers were talking to each other through their texts, and it's kind of like, hey, we know what, what is really at stake here. It's all about the intellect, yeah? So, you see, that was an important key for me. Once I got that, I found more of um, the motivation as to why the Greeks were so important to Muslims. It wasn't just a love affair. The love affair was there, but it was also because they, they took the Greeks to have kind of like, like the, the, you know, to offer the rational platform that would explain even religion. Yeah, so that is the, the big excitement. But do you mean then that um, this is a fundamentally different reception of the ancients by the Islamic tradition than it is given in the Western tradition? Right. Is that they, what they went, they went in a different direction. They had the same heritage that they both used and then the, the, West, the West had some more sources and the, the Islamic world had some more sources. But, you know, there is this overlap. Think of, you know, two, two circles, right, moving into, into one, 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 to, one into another. And um, there is a common area, you know, that they both use, but they went in different directions. And um, uh, maybe the Renaissance period is a good uh, period to show that, you know, individual and uh, and freedom and, you know, transformation and all of this is something that we relate to the Renaissance period. Um, Islamic world has some of the same sources, but um, it's not about the self in a way it became about the self in a Western context. 
And without getting into too many details here, because I'm obviously getting passionate here, so I'll, I'll just mention that uh, when it came to sciences, Muslim scientists took it to be uh, a mandate to be rational and explore the laws of the universe because they were convinced that that was conducive to religion. And that is a route the West did not take. That's just one example. I think this is, this is a good point to, 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 to finish here and to go on to the next question, sure. because the next question is in some ways related to this answer you gave now. And it is, which is the status of mysticism uh, within the Islamic tradition? Mm. I just said something about a love affair that Muslims had with the Greeks. And there is also the, the love affair with mysticism. As it happens with, um, you know, with love and loving relationships, there is also tensions, right? Mm -hmm. um, Sufism, as, as, it, as mysticism is called in Islam, is, uh, is an important power, I would say. And it's, bo and it's both uh, an intellectual and, um, and a religious power. Nobody will for sure be able to say when it started. What we know about Sufism is that there was at first an ascetic movement and then that these ideas with a, there uh, being a loving relationship between the individual Muslim and God is something that came later. And that's, by the way, where um, this famous woman from Basra, Rabia al adawiya played a major role. But before we get there, so what is the place of mysticism? I find mysticism part of Islamic philosophy. And that brings us a little bit back to the previous topic that we, that we touched on. You see, um, it would be a horrible thing, and it was a horrible thing for a long time, to say Islamic philosophy is a philosophy because they use the Greeks, right? And some people went, went as far as to say, well, thanks God they had the Greeks because otherwise there would be no rationalism in Islam, right? They would be all, you know, walking around mindlessly. mindlessly. Um, yes, the Greeks played a major role, but to me, Islamic philosophy is not complete without also including the law, so theology and law, without including mysticism and some more. So let's just stop at mysticism. Um, it is part of, part of reflection. It is pro part of inquiry. It is part of principles that uh, played a major role, both in a speculative way and in a practical way. And that to me is philosophy. We can't say, oh, wait a minute, you know, we never had an agreement that mysticism is part of philosophy in the West. And therefore, watch out, any world tradition that has mysticism, well, we will say, just sorry, guys, but you don't qualify. You just don't cut it. You know, you, you can't be part of the family of, of world philosophy. You can't. You can only do this properly if you go into every tradition and find out what is really relevant to that tradition. You can't say, this is important to the West. So if I don't find it in another tradition, let's say in Chinese tradition, well, sorry guys, then Chinese philosophy, no, no, definitely not philosophy. We'll call it um, a way of life. We'll call it uh, something important in practical terms, but philosophy, well, we could call it Chinese thought, right? But we're not going to call it Chinese philosophy, yeah? So you see, um, in order to do justice now to Islamic philosophy, which is our topic, you have to also accept that mysticism is part of that tradition. Now, I spoke of a, you know, a love, re love relationship uh, and um, there being tensions. Mainstream Islam, you know, the kind of theology that was taught in the schools, did not exactly embrace Sufism. Sometimes they just tolerated it. But it was never the case that Muslim theologians would say, all right, so you learn the rituals, you learn all that's, that matters, you memorize the Quran, and you become a Sufi, and that's how you're going to accomplish yourself as, as a good Muslim. That position you do not find in the official Islam. And yet, from the eighth century on, we have Sufis, and they saw themselves, both men and women, as contributing to Islam, Islam the religion, uh, Islamic spirituality, Islamic piety, Islamic charity, and so forth. Um, I spoke of the theology 
mostly tolerating Sufism. Well, there always have been phases where they did not tolerate it. Um, what we're looking at right now in the Islamic world is a, is a situation where many uh, Sufi sites, we're talking here shrines, we're talking here cemeteries, are being destroyed by Muslims who think that Sufism is not any, has nothing to do with Islam. Um, one of the issues that, let's call it fundamentalism, that fundamentalism has with Sufism is that they say, well, it became a matter of popular piety. People go there, pray to some dead saint, uh, hope for a special, you know, baraka, a special blessing, and that's not, not Islamic. You know, there's no intercession of the saints in Islam, like in Christianity, right? Uh, or at least like in Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Christianity, right? We can't do it without the intercession of the saints. So Suf Sufism has, has that component. Um, and so fundamentalists try to eradicate that. It's nothing new. It has happened before. Many attempts have been made before. But of course, if they, if they should succeed, I do not think that they will, but if they should, um, that would be a major loss for Islamic culture because I can guarantee you that in popular piety, Sufism plays an important role at many, many levels. Sufism is where men and women come together. Sufism is where charity work uh, works happen. Sufism can be public, but it can also be private. Women typically do their Sufi uh, remembrance sessions, the dhikr, in the privacy of the home. Um, it's, it's social, it's about bonds, it's about entire family traditions. Um, it's, it opens up a spirituality that's not in the books. Um, and without any question, it's a reality in the Islamic world, whether fundamentalist Islam likes to accept it, whether the theologians at the many venerable institutions like to accept it, but it's there, right? So it's definitely part of the tradition. Yes, but basically you say that um, Islamic mysticism is rejected by Islamic theology and not so much by Islamic philosophy. Is that, mm. Did I get it right? Is you this what you right. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you got me there, yes. yes. But there have been theologians who were also Sufis. I mean, you look at um, by the famous Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali was everything. He was a theologian, the logician, um, and the Sufi. Uh, so for him, it was all one. Yeah. Um, but um, of course, you know, there was never an agreement on Sufism and theology. But we'll come back to this topic um, later. But now let's, um, you mentioned already um, Rabia el Adawiya. This is the, the, um, the Islamic mystic. You will lead a workshop on here at Paderborn tomorrow. And after tomorrow, who was she? And which, let me add another question immediately, in which role did women play in uh, the Islamic philosophical tradition in general and in uh, Islamic mysticism in particular? Well, you know, in the official documents of Islamic philosophy, I would just say there is no woman. Um, we sometimes know about the sons of famous philosophers. Mm -hmm. We know about, you know, we know the names of the sons of Ibn Rushd, you know, the Latin word still calls him Averroes, but we don't have the names of, of his daughters. And that is true for, for all the major uh, figures in Islamic philosophy. And, and it's kind of like nagging at um, many women who, like me, uh, do work in philosophy, but always like to keep an eye on, you know, where are the women? So it's nagging me. So, I mean, can it be that none of these major figures has ever shared his knowledge with the daughters in the household? We know that physicians sometimes taught their daughters to become physicians and pharmacists and so forth. We know that women have been very important, um, even in theology, which is the most conservative discipline in, in the Islamic world. We know of um, major theologians who uh, acknowledge that um, their hadith teacher was a woman, that they learned all their stuff from, 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 from women. So we know women were, were present um, in theology, but I can't find one in philosophy, unless, unless, I, I do the same thing to, you know, the, 
the discipline of, of uh, mysticism that I did to the whole tradition of Islamic philosophy, which is to ask, do we have any texts, um, do we have any example of, of women who contributed to the speculative tradition, who contributed to uh, reflection on language, who contributed to uh, spirituality, right? And if you take that to be part of Islamic philosophy, which it is, mm -hmm. well, then you can start doing work on women. And um, Rabia is, is the first one I really, the first woman in uh, Islamic mysticism, I tried that. It wasn't easy. You see, she is, she's a legendary figure. Um, on one hand, it's great because everybody knows her or thinks they know her. So you don't have to, um, you know, spend too much time on uh, making a case that uh, she played a role. Everybody says she played a role. You look at, again, at Al-Ghazali, the theologian, his uh, younger brother, the Sufi, um, Farid al-Attar, and it goes on and on. Everybody mentions her. They even commented on some of her poetry. So she's, she's there, right? She's, she's hard to miss, right? We could, go, we could go further. But I found out that nevertheless, despite, despite her, um, um, you know, her fame, it was not really easy to get to now Rabia, the historic person, Rabia as the one who wrote poetry and Rabia as the one who used poetry to convey her teaching. So it was quite a challenge. So what I did is um, try to cut through the flamboyancy of Rabia. She must have been an extravagant woman, because you know, when somebody becomes legendary, I mean, the thing to do is not to say, well, this, this is all rubbish, and uh, surely she didn't fly on a carpet, <laughs> right? Which is a reaction that some scholars had. I think the question is, um, the question to ask is, what prompted those legends, right? So to me, the more of those stories I could collect, the more convinced I became there was this woman in the city of Basra. Basra today is in Iraq. And she was annoying to men. <laughs> they used to go to her home and, and provoke her and, and so forth. So why was she such a provocation? Well, she was a woman. I guess that's enough to be a provocation. She was a woman who... Um, lived by herself. You see, I, f I found out thanks to Rabia that um, if you were a slave, you know, if you were a woman and a slave, and you were emancipated, then you had great freedoms. Because you see, the woman who was born free and remained free would always have a male guardian, the father, the brother, the husband, and so forth, right? But the woman who was slave and became free doesn't have a guardian. And that was Rabia's chance. And, and I can see she, 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 she made um, you know, use of it outrageously. And, um, and then I thought, okay, you know, the story always goes, she had visitors, people would stop by. And I says, wait a minute, what do you mean she had visitors? <laughs> and some names kept, kept uh, recurring. No, she did not have visitors, she had students. <laughs> These are people who would come on a regular Basis and say, Rabia, you know, help me out with this. Rabia, what do you think? And Rabia would be teaching them. So that was the first angle I took that I think helped me understand this is not just some eccentric woman, right, uh, who loved God and such. This is someone who had a teaching. And then I looked at the, the sayings that have been collected. Some of them are written in exquisite Arabic poetry, classical poetry. There are, um, you know, there's a variety of meters in classical Arabic poetry. You know, you need to be quite educated to master those, and she did. And then I looked at how she used language, and I found out that the way how she used language presupposes a reflection on language. So that, to me, is also part of philosophy. And then, you know, she is all there the, you know, about this loving relationship and nothing matters. And some people would provoke her and say, Rabia, Rabia, do you love the prophet, right, Muhammad? She wouldn't buy that. She would just say, 
I have so much love for the Creator that there is not nothing left for any creature. Right? It's a very, very strong statement that she made. Um, and then, of course, there is ecstasy. And nowadays, you know, with philosophy developing ever more refined tools, there's an understanding. There is a philosophy of ecstasy. So you see, mm -hmm. if you look at Rabia just through the lens of what was applied to understand the major figures, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, and so forth, well, then she doesn't look like the philosopher. But if you understand that within mysticism, she has been extremely creative and original, and that she was probably the one who introduced love into asceticism, which is the birth of Sufism, you say, wait a minute, here is definitely a woman who played a role. Fantastic. You, this is wonderful, and it seems to be such an, an, an interesting person. Rabia el you have made us all very curious about her, I think. Um, in some points you said, I felt reminded of the Optima, mm. <laughs> but then the ways changed a bit. Um, we, uh, let us leave then uh, all you have to say about her then for the workshop and uh, finish our, our conversation now with a more general question. I thought of talking or coming back to mysticism and its different status in the Islamic philosophy and in the Western philosophy because mysticism is a very marginalized discipline in the Western philosophy since enlightenment at least. Uh, and I thought maybe in um, Islamic philosophy it could be different, but I think you said already a lot about that um, point. So um, let me just ask you a really general question. Um, how do philosophy and theology relate in the Islamic tradition? I, I think it's a big question, just some, some main points, maybe you right. can say something about it. Well, of course, it depends on who you ask. You ask someone called Ibn Taymiyyah in the 14th century who had a philosophical training and who is now something like the patron of fundamentalists and uh, there is no relationship between theology and, and philosophy in Islam. Now, there are many different words that are used for philosophy in Arabic language. And that is true in, in many more uh, non-Western traditions. So we say philosophy. Right. Maybe we add thought, but that's about it. In Arabic, you can say falsafa. And usually when you use that word, you mean Greek-derived philosophy. Um, I'll just point out one more term. There are many more. But the other term that I think is very relevant here is, um, is hikmah, and that is wisdom. Even Ibn Rushd, right, as the commentator as he's being seen in the Western tradition, um, in many of his works, prefers to speak of hikmah than falsifa. And I think what he did is try to give philosophy um, a home in the Islamic world. Falsifa, well, obviously the word itself just always reminds you, hey, this came from some, somewhere else. But what Ibn Rush did, and, and many more, is say, well, you know, wisdom, I mean, philosophy, What is it, right? The love, the love uh, for wisdom. So wisdom is something that doesn't belong to just one tradition. Obviously, you, there is wisdom also uh, in the Islamic tradition. There is wisdom in Arab values and, and, and so forth. Um, so if you broaden right, the understanding of what philosophy is, well, then there is a perfect communication between philosophy and theology in the Islamic world. And they complete each other. The way I put it to my students is to say, we walk on two legs. And I see that that's exactly what Muslim philosophers did in their works, which is that they usually did not challenge Islam at all. You know, Islam, the religion, Islamic theology and such. But they felt it was really important to give another track, right? So there is the track of religion and there is the track of philosophy. And now because of that rationalist presupposition that, in my mind, comes from the Mu'tazila, they could really say, well, no matter what you do in philosophy, for as long as you, men, you remain rational, you will not contradict religion. And sometimes they went further than that and they said, well, for as long as you reason well and you can lay out your reasoning, well, whatever you find out in philosophy overrides 
what you find in scripture, because what you think is going to be basically the blueprint underneath scripture. But that is Islamic philosophy in the classical period. Things change later on. Um, you see, what another problem that the field has is that um, you find so many experts who say, Islamic philosophy, it died, it vanished. You know, the Mongols came, destroyed Baghdad. Whew. You know, Dar al hikmah the House of Wisdom, which was um, the Abbasid version of the library in Alexandria, you know, it had everything, you know, like, Alex, like the library in, Alex, in Alexandria. It was a library, it was, a, it was um, laboratories, um, um, observatories, pharmacists, hospitals. So kind of like, you know, the Mongols came and all of that vanished. It is true, the Sunni empire took a, he a heavy blow. And the Sunni world had a hard time recovering intellectually and scientifically. But you see, centers of learning shifted. And that happened in Europe too. I mean, Athens was the big deal in the days of Plato, right? Every decent philosopher wanted to go to Athens. Who goes to Athens today? You don't go to Athens because you want to study philosophy. You go to Athens because of the Acropolis, because of the food and, and so forth, right? So if we can concede that centers of learning shifted in Europe, and they still do, well, why can't centers of learning shift in the Islamic world? And as a matter of fact, they kept shifting east. There is a wonderful uh, Swiss philosopher. I'm also Swiss, so I'll, I have to mention him. His name is Elmar Hollenstein. He created a uh, philosophical atlas the best I've seen. And so what he suggests, among many things, is that if we stop focusing just on the Mediterranean world, we do find that Islamic philosophy survived in different places. But we are just there, kind of in the Mediterranean world. If it's not there, it's nowhere. No. <laughs> it, it did well in, the, in Persia. Uh, and Persia, for a long time, included Central Asia. And from Central Asia, it went to China, and I go back to what I've said in the beginning. So, you see, it's, we have to understand, again, that when it comes to a non-Western tradition, we can't apply the same criteria that we work with when we are within Western philosophy. You have to take into account, it's different. And if you, see, if you do that, you'll see how alive and how well it is. Well. Thank you very much All for right. coming and for this interview. You are welcome.